talking about um, on my Facebook page mainly. Um, I'm also doing this live on YouTube. So for some of the people who might not have seen my posts on Facebook recently, um, I've been talking a lot about tack and equipment and the ethics behind it. And I wanted to go a little bit more in detail on that on live because I have more ability to kind of explain my thoughts. Um, and I think that's really important because I just want to open a dialogue for people to really start considering how they go about choosing the equipment that they use on their horses. Cause I think that this is one of the things that is honestly underrated, but like should be considered a lot more in horse training. Um, so yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about is tack and equipment ethics. Um, a lot of this discussion is kind of going to surround bits because I would say that these are the, the most commonly abused piece of equipment simply by default of the fact that um, bits are one of the most common pieces of equipment that people are encouraged to use in the first place. And with the amount of diversity that we have um, for bits in the marketplace being sold to everyone, there's just a lot of room for pe people to end up selecting things that are harmful to the horse. Um, one thing that I think is really important to touch on that I think every horse person should consider when choosing their equipment is that at the end of the day, the horse world is a profitable industry. Um, selling equipment that promises people quick fixes and promises to address problems that they're having with their horses and areas of difficulty that they're experiencing and do and fix it quickly, that is extremely profitable. And companies are naturally going to capitalize off of that. So what I think is really important for people to consider when they're making decisions for their horses is that you can't trust marketing to the standpoint of like assuming that stuff wouldn't be available for sale if it wasn't ethical or that it wouldn't be legal in the show ring if it wasn't ethical, because there's already a lot of evidence that ethics are very loosely protected and not saying it nicely in the show ring. Um, and at the end of the day, like businesses, if they can profit a ton off of selling lots of equipment and they're, they don't have to watch people using it. So in terms of feeling guilty or ashamed of what they're selling, they can separate themselves quite nicely from what their equipment is actually doing to the horses. And they just get to look at the paychecks. So the bit and training aid industry is probably one of the most diverse and, um, like bought into areas of the horse world because people are always looking for quick fixes and that's not like an attack on anyone it's something that i have done myself um i used to like anytime i was having a problem with a horse the go-to thing that was suggested to me by trainers that i worked with is like checking their bit or changing their bit um and even if it wasn't directly suggested there would be situations where like if i was struggling with the horse being too heavy in my hands or if they were bolting or if they were rushing at jumps and whatnot, an instructor would change the bit. So then naturally, even if you're only watching the decisions they make, you go, okay, this is how I solve these problems. And that was how I focused on a lot of the problem solving that I did in years prior. And like at times, like it was a band-aid fix and you would see an immediate difference and you'd go, okay, like now my horse can't run and rush at fences as easily. But ultimately, like a lot of the times the problems would arise again at a later date, even if the bit temporarily fixed it. And more importantly, even if it did fix problems long term, I think the most important thing that we can take away from any equipment choice is that if we're selecting equipment that solves problems for us, but creates new problems for our horse by way of causing them pain, that's not ethical. We cannot just be looking out for ourselves in this equation and being able to make your horse do something easier and being able to move in, in training faster. That is not enough of a measure of whether or not it's okay to do something because how the horse feels about things matters. And the horse world has very conveniently done a great job of separating the pieces of equipment that we use from the cause and effect that they have on the horse. And one of the most prominent ways that people do that is to use the statement, the bit is only as harsh as the rider's hands. And there's a lot of reasons why I have a problem with this statement, but I'm just going to go over a few of them. The first one would be that I see a lot of people use this logic to essentially imply that they are a better, more well-versed, more educated rider with amazingly soft hands because they use a harsh bit. 
And when people point out the mechanics of the bit and say, like, that's not very nice to your horse, a lot of people will throw it back at them and be like, oh, well, you must have bad hands then if you can't use this. Like, not everyone is that experienced. Um, and it's a very convenient way of evading accountability for how the equipment you're using is actually working. The other thing is that to claim that a bit is only as harsh as the rider's hands, it also completely negates the, the mechanics of equipment. So for example, if you're using a twisted wire bit, it's constructed in a way where it creates pressure points in the mouth and where it's an abrasive material and it's uncomfortable even at rest. The rider doesn't have to be pulling on it at all for it to be uncomfortable for the horse. And also another important thing to note is that when bits are created in a way to amplify the pressure from the rider's hands, either by a leverage effect or with the abrasive mouthpieces like um, like a twisted wire bit, no matter how softly you're applying those aids, the mechanics of the bit are amplifying the effect of your hands. So the riders can feel like they're being really, really soft. They can feel like they're barely touching the mouth. But to the horse, the effect of the aids is being amplified. So even if your hands would be soft in a different bit and you're not applying very much pressure in your head, to the horse it feels really different if the mechanics of what you're using are made to amplify every amount of pressure that you apply to the horse. The other thing is that in the rain tension studies that have been done with riders and horses, including like upper level competition riders, um, Pretty consistently, the riders thought that they were being way lighter and applying way less pressure than they actually were. And if you think about it, it really does make sense because we're not the ones feeling the pressure. And how much pressure you think you're applying to your horse's mouth is really relative to the way that you've been brought up and instructed. Because if you started out having really rough hands um, and they've gotten better with time, you're going to feel like you're being soft. But that doesn't mean that the actual pressure being applied to the horse is soft. So we have to be really careful not to use excuses like the bit is only as harsh as the rider's hands because that completely negates mechanics. And we can't ignore the mechanics of how things work. And the same thing applies to certain types of training aids and gadgets. If they are made to amplify the effect of the rider's aids, it doesn't really matter if the rider is being soft because you also have to factor in the fact that the equipment you're using is made to amplify aids. And the same goes for using stuff like spurs. Like, and this isn't, I'm not going to bash spurs, but if you're putting spurs on, the purpose is to isolate a localized amount of pressure into a small area, um, which will create more pressure per square inch. And it's going to be more uncomfortable to the horse no matter how little pressure you're applying, applying the same amount of pressure wearing a spur versus a boot heel, a boot heel is going to be more distributed over the horse's sides. So it's not going to apply the same amount of pressure into this tiny little surface area. So even if you're applying the same amount of pressure, if, there, if it's more widely distributed and if it's using something that's not causing a leverage effect or amplifying pressure or creating pressure points, et cetera, it's not going to hurt as much if it's not being amplified by something else. So the same amount of pressure applied with like, let's say a twisted wire bit versus a snaffle is always going to be harsher. It doesn't matter if the rider is being really soft with their hands. If you've selected a piece of equipment that is made to amplify pressure, it's going to feel harsher to the horse. And the same thing goes with like leverage bits. If you're applying the same amount of pressure to a leverage bit versus a snaffle or a side pull, it is going to be more aggressive in the leverage bit because that is the nature of how these bits work. And we really need to be honest with ourselves about how the equipment we select works. Otherwise, we can quickly spiral into doing really unethical things, even if that's not our intention, because we're ignoring the mechanics of how things work. So how the equipment we use works is something that every rider needs to consider. And what I also want to let people know is that your riding instructors aren't necessarily portraying accurately to you how equipment works. I'm not going to say that all of them are lying, but like growing up, what I was told about how the equipment I was using worked was not true. A lot of it was really downplayed, even if there was some truth to it. Um, it sought to justify any of the equipment that was suggested to me by my instructors. And they weren't going to say anything bad and be honest and be like, yeah, this, like I, I used to ride my Arabian in like a really, really thin twisted wire, which is like basically like riding in like a cheese knife. Um, and I was told that he liked the bit better because he was more responsive to it. But the reason why he was more responsive to it is because if he leaned on it, it would literally cut into the, his gums. 
Like it would literally cut his mouth if he leaned too heavily on it. So he had to be more responsive. It wasn't that he liked it more. It was that the consequence was a lot greater if he didn't respond to it. So then I got a really soft and responsive horse and I didn't have to apply very much pressure at all for him to back right off of it. And it wasn't that my hands were soft because they certainly didn't feel soft to him. I was applying less pressure than I might in a different bit, but it didn't feel like less to him because it was isolating it into a way smaller surface area while also using an abrasive material in his mouth. So it didn't feel soft to him. So no matter how softly I thought I was applying my rain aids, it doesn't matter because the equipment that I selected was made to amplify the effect that the horse felt. So if you find yourself ever using the excuse, the bit is only as harsh as the rider's hands, I think you should stop yourself right there and then go, the bit is only as harsh as the mechanics allow it to be. And another justification I see people usually follow this up with, if you point out the fact that mechanics can make certain equipment harsh, no matter what, is they'll be like, oh, well, like you can abuse a snaffle too, if you're, if you're like, tearing up the horse's mouth and that's true you can abuse anything you could freaking abuse a pool noodle if you hit your horse with it a bunch of times and scared them you can abuse your hands that you scratch your horses with if you chose to use them as weapons and hit your horse you can abuse anything the potential to abuse anything does not justify the use of things that are far far easier to abuse even when the rider's intention isn't to abuse them and even when the rider isn't applying very much pressure so anything can be abused and the thing that I find most interesting in the discussion on bits and specifics is that a lot of people will bring up how bitless riding can be abused too. And it's like, yes, any anytime you're applying pressure to a body, you can be abusing it, even if it's an amount of pressure that the body might like in certain circumstances. If it's something where they're not actively consenting to it, or if they're sore in a certain area and you're applying pressure, it doesn't really matter if it's a benign level of pressure, if it's uncomfortable for them. So you can abuse quite literally anything. And the deflection tactics that we use to essentially be like, oh, well, like X, Y, Z can also be abused to kind of deflect away from the point that certain equipment is engineered to cause more discomfort. And that's how we gain control of horses. It kind of destroys the conversation and seeks to just point fingers in other areas when the areas that we're pointing are harder to abuse at default because they're not amplifying the pressure of the rider's hands to the same extent. Um, you can cause damage with a bitless bridle too, like even just a regular side pull. You can cause damage in like a flat leather halter if you're being aggressive enough. But that's the key is the amount of aggression that you really need to apply to cause damage in those circumstances is quite a bit more than what you would need to do to cause damage in a twisted wire snaffle. So that's kind of where we need to look at it because the threshold of how much you need to do in order to cause lasting damage or to abuse a horse with certain training aids that are softer and don't inflict the same amount of leverage pressure you need to apply a lot more pressure to actually effectively abuse them which leaves a far um a far like more open margin of error whereas if you're riding in a double twisted wire snaffle gag Basically, any pressure you apply is going to feel uncomfortable to the horse. So you have the margin for error is freaking huge. Like you can just you can create issues without even intending to. And the other thing, too, that I think is important is the equipment we use. I think something that everyone should think about is like, what if my horse got loose in this? What if you fell off? What if the reins fell off over the horse's head? What if the horse stepped on the reins? Is the equipment you're riding in going to break their jaw or cut their tongue off if something like that happens? What if they accidentally loop their reins over a fence post or something while they're itching their head or something? What if an accident happens and they were to pull back or step on their reins? Or if you fell off and you panicked and held onto the reins because when you're falling, grabbing onto something is a normal um reflexive response what if something like that happens and you end up applying way more pressure than you typically would in any other situation is the equipment you're going to use is it going to cause a lot of damage to the horse um because for example with a side pull pulling if you fall off and you yank on the horse's face it's going to be uncomfortable it's going to cause them pain but the amount of pain it causes and the amount of lasting damage it causes is going to be less than if you're falling and you're grabbing onto the reins of a gag bit and pulling 
it's going to be less traumatic for the horse. It's still not great. It's still not fun for the horse. It's still not going to be pain free, but it's less of a risk. And that's something that I always think about now because it doesn't really matter the situation. It could, anything can happen. Even if you don't fall off, your horse could trip and fall. Um, like I said, they could rub their face on something and get caught up in something. Stuff happens. And until something really bad happens, a lot of people don't consider these things. And then when the really bad, terrible thing happens, you're left with the damage where you have to deal with something that can take a long time to heal and that your horse is going to be traumatized by. And at that point, you have a way bigger mess to clean up. Um, so the equipment we use matters. And what I do think too, with the horse world that is a huge problem is that a lot of people feel entitled to use whatever equipment they want to without any type of criticism and without any type of judgment and essentially just have people support it. And the fact of the matter is there is a lot of equipment out there that you can legally purchase and that you can legally show in, in a lot of disciplines that simply is not ethical to the horse. And if you make the choice to use that anyways, I do think that it should rightfully so open someone up to criticism. And there's like certain situations where I think people are deserving of less judgment. Uh, like, for example, I don't agree with the regular use of like nose chains and lip chains because I think that those are really aggressive and that they're overused and they're often used as a band-aid to fix behavioral problems. However, there's been times where I've had to go pick up horses from the track who have been stalled 24-7 and who are now out of work because the season ended and they've just been sitting in a stall for like a week and I have to walk them near a road to go put them in a trailer. So there's been times where I've had to have like either myself or other people feed horses in nose chains or lip chains, but then as soon as they get home, I never use those things again because I am dealing with the issues that are causing those behavioral problems in the first place. I don't agree with their use, but if it's in an emergency situation like that, it's a lot different than a regular training situation. And that's also another excuse that I see people use is like, what about an emergency? Any emergency you can think of is not a training situation. You're not going to be training your horse in a wildfire and actually trying to make long-term lasting progress. You're trying to get the hell out of there. You're not actually actively training. And the same thing applies to if you're getting a horse for a really unideal situation and the horse is behaving so dangerously that your life is at risk and that they are potentially at risk of hurting themselves. How you handle that situation is not a training situation. You're handling an emer like an emergent situation to get a horse out of a situation and get them to a place where you can make it a training situation. And you're just using something as a temporary fix in that instance. So in that way, it's entirely different. And that is the way people should look at it. Is this a training situation? Is it not? If you're in an emergency situation and your life is in danger, do whatever you need to do to keep yourself safe. But regular everyday training and preparing your horse to be a show horse or a trail horse or whatever it is that you want to do with them, that is not the same as an emergency situation. It's not. And we should not use emergency situations to effectively justify doing whatever we want to do to our horses um, on the basis of like, oh, but what if this was an emergency? It's not. It's not. When I go out to handle my horses in the field, it's not an emergency situation. Um, and in situations where you have limited resources, it's a lot different than what you select to use in your everyday choices with your horse. And I think that's something that we all need to be honest with ourselves about is like what is actually motivating our decision making. You don't have to like what you're using in an emergency situation, but if it's what is necessary, then you do it. Another example is I don't I don't twitch my horses. I don't like twitching horses. I know that it's uncomfortable. I know that it's using pain to create like a gagged paralyzed response however for vet procedures where you've sedated horses to the point that you can't like the, the most you can and you still can't get close enough to them to freeze the area that you're trying to work on that is different i would let a vet twitch my horse in a veterinary emergency situation for the horse's well-being and able like ability to access medical help um but it's different than if I were to, for example, want to clip my horse for aesthetic reasons or to like body clip them for a show or whatever. Um, 
it would be my job to prepare them for that situation if I really want to do that rather than just perpetually using a twitch to get it done and that's like I used to use a twitch all the time for clipping my Arabian when I was showing Arabs back in the day and it was lazy I didn't put the work in to introduce him to the clippers and if I had it would have been a lot easier and I would have never needed a twitch but comparatively the last time I used a twitch in recent years was when Harlow degloved her ear and we could not get we could not touch her ear to clean it and stitch it up and um debride the flesh and get the freezing in there and do all that stuff and she was sedated to the point where if we hit her with more sedation she was probably going to be on the floor and we didn't want her to be down completely with sedation so she was twitched momentarily so that they could clean her ear um and get the vet care that she needed done i didn't like it i know she didn't like it i know that it caused her pain but also her her ear getting infected and causing issues would have been very painful too. So it's kind of the lesser of two evils in that circumstance. If there is any way of avoiding that, I would have, but we couldn't touch her ear, even with the amount of sedation that she had on board. And if you give a horse sedation to the point where they're, it's ambiguous whether or not they're going to fall over, it's also very dangerous for the vet. So in situations like that, I let my vet make the decision because it's their safety that's on the line. And um locally a few years ago a vet did have an accident where a horse responded to sedation differently than what they were expecting um and fell on them and paralyzed them so in situations like that it's like you got to do what you got to do for other people's safety but everyday training and like preparing your horse for jumping for example is not an emergency situation I've seen people go like, oh, my horse can be really rushy at fences and it can get dangerous. And it's like, okay, fair enough. But also like if they can't regulate their pace safely, why are you jumping them? Uh, especially big jumps. Like why are you, why are you, why do you need to be jumping three foot six right now? If your horse cannot have a rhythmic gait or even if they're speeding up, cannot speed up controllably um and like respond to your aids in a safe manner why are you jumping them that high why do they need to go to a show right now why do they need to be jumping a full course why can't you go back to flat work and doing ground poles and getting them to regulate their pace better and getting them to be more responsive to your aids rather than just using a harsher bit and that's a rhetorical question that i'm just going to answer myself and say the reason why people don't want to do that is because it would it would deprive them of the instant gratification that they're seeking. They want to be able to take their horse to the show right away. They want to be able to move up the levels right away and jump higher and jump harder courses and do more. They don't want to put the work in that it would require to fix those issues without using harsher equipment. So that's why they move to using harsher equipment because they want the end result right away without putting the work in. But then the problem is that it always comes at an expense. Like if you're going to just slap a harsher bit on a horse who's throwing their head up and just running through the bridle, it's not going to address the bodily issues that are resulting in them doing that in the first place. And they're going to inevitably take impact on another part of their body from the tension that they are carrying and from the tension that being ridden in painful equipment is going to continue to inflict on them. It's not going to come at a free cost. It's going to come at the cost of future soundness and health um, and also correctness. Whereas if you put the work in for the long run, like in the immediate short term, it is less fun. You don't get as much instant gratification. However, in the long run, you do have an easier time and a more enjoyable time at shows because your horse is better prepared and you're not having to deal with all of these behavioral problems that never got addressed that you're just using equipment to cover up. Uh, it saves a lot of grief and it's a lot more fun. And this this isn't to say that people can never still run into issues because they're horses um, and stuff happens. But if you put the work in, you experience less of those issues in the long run. Whereas if you look for the instant gratification, you're either going to run into like soundness issues, you're going to sour your horse, or you're just going to perpetually have these stress issues that consistently keep repeating themselves over and over and over again, because they're not being addressed. And it can slow down your progress in the long run by leaving major holes in your horse's training that you have to address at a later date. And it always comes at a cost. And like, I, I share these things, like people think that I share these things to get like attention or to like 
be annoying or to like act like I'm better than everyone. And like, there, there's so many reasons people can come up with like their own conclusion to anything. Like, I don't really care. But the reason why I share them is because I look back at situations where I did the same thing in and I see how much it set me back. I see the damage it did to my horses. And if I can help even one person not do that to their horse and stop going down that path sooner than what I did, then that's a worthy cause because I really wish that I changed things sooner because it would have helped me and my horses a lot. And I would have been further ahead by now if I had done that earlier. And if I hadn't been perpetually seeking these instant gratification responses and trying to get my horses to move up the levels faster and to do more with them faster and just to like cover up behavioral issues instead of dealing with them. Because in the short term, I got to move along a little bit quicker for a short period of time, but it always catches up with you and it always ends up causing problems in some way or another. And if I just stuck it out and done things the right way and built a better foundation instead of using equipment to cover up the issues that I wasn't fixing, I would have been further along because my horses wouldn't have met these cyclical problems that I was always seeing reoccur. And it also would have prevented a lot of soundness issues if I just put the work in to do the foundational stuff first. So I share this stuff in hopes that it'll kind of click with someone and have them realize that like something taking longer in the short term isn't a bad thing. We've created this narrative in the horse world where people believe that faster is always better, that the best trainers can accomplish things the fastest and that the quicker you see results, the better the training is. When really in a lot of times, if you see results super quickly and horses are being asked to do more and more and more really, really quickly, oftentimes it's the result of them being pushed too hard, too fast, and it's going to sacrifice correctness because like us, horses are these living beings that need to build up muscular fitness and need to build up physical ability to do the things that we ask them just because you can make them do something faster doesn't mean that their body is physically ready to do it safely and correctly and that's just the reality of things we we have to put the time in to help them physically develop properly and you can't speed up physical development putting draw reins on your horse to get them to put their head down faster isn't going to suddenly grow them the muscles that they need to have proper self carriage because that takes time and the analogy I always use is like planking for people because holding yourself in a plank position, especially a correct one where your back isn't sagging or your back isn't like roached um, and doing so for an extended period of time is really hard to do. And that's just with like your own, your own body weight, like without packing any weight on your back. Now imagine putting like, let's say 10% of your body weight, 10 to 15% of your body weight and trying to hold that plank for the same amount of time as you can without any weight on your back. You're really going to struggle. And yet this is essentially what we ask horses to do for extended periods of time while trapping them in harsh bits, training aids that force their heads in certain positions and using all sorts of things to essentially gag their ability to be like, hey, like my body isn't ready for this. I'm struggling and to show you where they're struggling and why. And we just, we, we expect them to just move along faster. And it takes time to build muscle. Like it's not ever going to be something fast. Like basically every framework that we have been taught to be so normal in horse training, if you really unpack it, even just from a physical standpoint, not factoring in mental and emotional health, even just from the physical standpoint, how quickly people want to bring horses along is really kind of crazy if you think about it. Like within the matter of like a year, people will take horses from never having packed a rider to going walk, trot, canter and over fences. And within the matter of 30 days, people expect their horses to be started fully under saddle and going walk, trot, canter when they've never packed weight before and doing so for like half an hour at a time. And that is a lot that that's a lot to ask. It would be like entering a physical training program and having your personal trainer just be like, okay, we're going to throw you into like the workload that I would throw like a, like a, an athlete into so that has been competing and doing this for a long time. You're just going to get thrown into the deep end and have to start off just going hard, full, full, full bore. And 
have no build up to it essentially or you get like a couple days of build up but then on the third day it's like okay now we're gonna just do the full thing now you need to do all of these things and do it while packing weight for extended periods of time and if you try to communicate that you're tired or that your muscles hurt they just make you keep going they just ignore you and make you more uncomfortable until you keep going and if you continue to do that even though your body's not physically fit enough different areas of the body are going to have to take the impact of the areas of the body that are becoming too fatigued to continue correctly working. And that's effectively what we're doing to a lot of horses. I do think that that's the reason behind a lot of the top line dysfunction that we see in horses. Like, yes, some of it's related to like hoof issues and underlying soundness issues, but I think that we create a lot of soundness issues. Um, in addition to the building of incorrect muscle, because people have this belief that, we should be able to bring horses along super, super fast. And it does not factor in how long it actually takes to build physical fitness. And now that I've kind of understand it more, it's honestly insane to me to look back on what some of my expectations were for horses and like how quickly they enter training and how quickly they're expected to build up to doing really hard work and how long they're expected to pack the weight of a human for right away. And we kind of set them up for failure from the very beginning by having completely unfair expectations for them. And there's a lot of equipment on the market to help people do that faster without consideration for the horse's health and soundness. Um, and that's why we need to be really careful with the equipment we use. And that's also why I'm so against a lot of harsh equipment, because like, it makes it easier for people to force these things. If people had to just work with the easiest equipment out there, they wouldn't be able to force things as quickly. They'd have a way more balanced idea of how their horse actually feels about things. And they would not be able to push things along as fast. It would hold them more accountable by default of not allowing them to cut corners as easily. And the fact that there is so much equipment on the market that people can use to push things along faster creates issues that could otherwise be avoided. So it's really hard to watch. And it's also really sad because we have all these really well-intentioned horse people that are being led astray by industry-wide belief systems that if you really look at it, don't hold up in practice. Like I don't know any mammal that can go from never having done something physically to being able to do it at essentially full steam within a matter of days or weeks, um, especially without sacrificing health and soundness in the process. And we expect that of horses all the time. And it's just really, really unfair to them. So that's kind of why I've completely altered the way I go about training. And it makes my stuff less exciting for people to watch if they're looking for fast paced, exciting things that have stuff moving along really quickly. But it's better for the horses. I think one of the most potent things that I've noticed in terms of like this long, slow way of bringing along horses is Banksy's top line strength compared to any other horse I've started. Um, and any other horse that I've really like seen started recently, because since he's done so much work on the ground, it hasn't had to pack a rider. And since his intro to packing a rider has been short periods of time and like a gradual buildup, his ability to carry a rider while engaging his core and actually using his back compared to a horse that hasn't had that long, slow um, bring up and hasn't had the groundwork put in. He can do it for way longer and be lifting his back way more correctly than a lot of like broke, broke, broke horses can, because he's had the time to build up that level of strength and do so in a manner where he hasn't been worked to the point where he gets fatigued and then, droops his back and just hollows out because his back is tired and you can feel it when you're on him you can feel how much stronger his back feels and how much more stable it feels because of that and that has really altered the way that I go about doing things and why I've taken it so slow with him because he's going to be five this year and he really is still super green and I'm planning on starting to do more stuff with him this year but I see how much it has benefited how he looks physically uh, to take things slow and how much he benefits from doing lots of groundwork and how much benefit I get as a result of that. And it also avoids him having like a really negative perspective of riding because he's not being worked to the point where he's like physically sore or upset um, or really, really fatigued. And 
he's very communicative as a result. Like he will let you know if something bothers him, even if it's something that's like really momentarily fleeting. And there's a lot of dialogue available that makes it easier to see like how he's feeling in any given moment and gives a lot of information for people to continue like changing the way they do things to make him more happy. So like that has been huge for me. Cause I, like, I wish I'd started all my horses that way cause they would have been better for it as, adult horses um but you live and you learn and this is why i'm so passionate about talking about like the equipment stuff because i think that the vast majority of horse people are well intentioned and this is why like i'm really careful to like how often i throw around the term abusive because i don't think that people doing things in a, in a stressful manner is necessarily to the point of being abusive but there's a lot of stuff that we're taught to do that isn't particularly fair to our horses and there's a lot of really well-intentioned people who absolutely without question love their horses most of the people who have horses love their horses they love 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 their horses they don't want to cause them pain um but for years they've been taught to do things that do exactly that that cause them physical or emotional pain for extended periods of time and then when they're met with the idea that that's what they've been doing it is such a painful thing to accept that a lot of people double down and go into denial and don't want to accept that fact and it means that they impede their ability to grow and change for the future in the long run by having it be so uncomfortable to accept those things and like for me it was the same way like it was really really hard to learn about horse stress and then kind of be met with like the really uncomfortable reality that a lot of the horses that i had been around growing up and a lot of my own horses had been highly stressed and for a while it was easier to just be like there's no way this is true because if this is true it means every horse i've ever handled has been stressed and i went into that denial for a time and then it kind of hit the point where i was like okay like no, like the information here does make sense, even though it's uncomfortable for me. And like, ultimately I can either accept it and grow and move on, or I can, I can continue doing things the way I've been doing and do so with the knowledge in the back of my head that it's harming my horse. Um, but again, it's not about perfection. Horses will still spook sometimes. They'll still be reactive. But like, I think the thing that people need to touch on is that like, how often is this happening? How often is your horse being really, really nervous and uncomfortable? How often are they having these big explosive events? When they do have explosive events, how short-lived are they? How do they recover from them? How long does it take them to relax to the point where they can walk on a loose rein after them? These are all the questions to ask because if it's short-lived and they recover really quickly, great. If it doesn't happen very often, great. If they're usually a mellow, even temper and they're usually in a really well emotionally regulated state, great. That's really all we need to be looking for. It's not about achieving perfection. It's about what do you accept as your normal? Is your normal your horse fighting you the whole time and being really stressed and being super reactive and having to worry about your safety to the point where you need harsher and harsher equipment? Or is your normal having your horse be emotionally regulated to the point where when they do react, it's short lived. They come back to you quite quickly and you're able to get their headspace back into a healthy frame of mind. Because if that's the case, great. It's not about perfection. Yesterday, Milo had a moment because he went after my dog when she ran, ran by him. Um, and he was like hopping around for like probably 15 seconds and then stopped and walked off on a loose. This all happened bridalist. So like it was manageable. He had a moment I hadn't ridden him in like three weeks because of the rain and I just got on him and went and he was perfect, perfect, perfect until enough things happened in short enough succession that he was like, okay, now I'm overwhelmed. And this was the final catalyst for my overwhelm. I need to do something physically to get rid of that physical pent up nervous anxiety or energy. And as soon as he did that, he's like, okay, let's go. I'm going to walk off after. And then he was fine. Uh, but yeah, stuff happens. It's not always going to be perfect rides, but it's what do we accept as our normal? Because if your normal is your horse displaying signs of stress on a regular basis, then that's something you need to ask yourself. Is this the normal that you want to continue throughout their life? Because that was Milo's normal for so many years. He was explosive and stressed every single ride. He would buck every single ride and he would do so fully tacked and full equipment, not just bridalist and would be explosive. And especially after time off, like if I got a, on him, like after three weeks off without lunging him a couple of years ago, um, it wouldn't have been safe. 
especially freaking Bridalis. But it's like, yeah, what do you accept as your normal? If he were to continue having reactions like he did yesterday on a regular basis and not recover from them, but even if he did on a regular basis, then that's a problem. But if most of my rides are without incident and he's very good at self-regulating and that when he does get elevated, he is able to listen, respond and come back from it and we can move on. Then it's not a problem because like I would view it the same as with people. You're never going to live a life where you're never anxious. You're never going to live a life where you never get overstimulated and you never snap and you never have moments. It's not a reasonable thing to expect. But if you're snapping and having moments all the time throughout the day with very little things, very little in the way of triggers to have that happen. And if you're chronically anxious and stressed, that's very expensive to the body. It's not good for your health. It's not a nice state of mind to be in. And it's a problem. And it's something that should be addressed instead of just being like, oh, that's my personality. I'm just an anxious and unhappy person. And we do that for horses where we label them as just being this way personality wise. And we never deal with the issues because we're just equating it to being personality. Um, Anyways, thank you for listening. And that is why I think people should use the lightest equipment possible. The more work you do with your horse at Liberty, the way more insight you're going to have on how they actually feel about the work you're doing and how regulated they actually are on their own. Because if they have the ability to either leave or respond in ways that aren't as easy to control and gag with equipment, you're going to get a very honest outlook on, of how they feel. And that's why I've been riding Milo Bridalist more because if he's having a really bad day where he can't regulate, I deserve to get thrown off because I didn't listen. Not that that's happened because I would do groundwork if he was in that frame of mind and I wouldn't keep riding if he was like that the whole time. But like it gives him the ability to respond when I'm starting horses under saddle at Liberty. It puts me to it, it holds me to a standard where I need to prepare them well enough that they're not going to hurt me when I get on and they're, they're not going to react. And that means that I'm doing better work because I'm ensuring that even without the equipment to stop them from moving, that they'll stay with me. Um, and that's not practical for everyone to do, but even if you have equipment on them, like I would kind of operate with that mentality, like without trying to gag their response and just get them to the emotional state where you don't need to be physically restraining them in order to have things go in a positive direction. Anyways, thank you for watching everyone. Don't forget to check out my other channels. Um, if you want more specific like training videos that show tutorials and stuff, I have Patreon um, that has a ton of different training tutorials and goes more in depth. And I'm going to be adding more to Patreon this week as well. And we're also doing a Q&A. So if you subscribe soon, you can join in on the monthly Q&A as well, where you can ask as many questions as you want. Anyways, thanks for watching, everyone. Have a good day.